name is Lori Douglas. I'm calling from Our Lady of the Lake Hospital. No, I just want to let you know she's had a bit of a neural change. This is Crowd Science from the BBC World Service. I'm Alex Lathbridge, and this is Lori, an intensive care nurse living in Baton Rouge in the USA. She works long hours, doing an incredibly physically and emotionally demanding job. So, her question for this episode might surprise you. I noticed that some people in my family are really energetic, like all the time, and others are the exact opposite of that. In my workplace too, some of my colleagues will do as little as possible, where others are always doing some kind of busy work. And then they go to the gym after work, and then they clean their houses, and they run errands. And I have to give myself a pep talk to even get dressed on my days off. I just, I love to laze around and do nothing, even when I know that there's chores to be done and errands to be run. So my question for crowd science is, why am I so lazy? I think I love you because I (laughs) completely understand this. Okay, today is your day off, yeah? Yes, it is. Where are you right now? (laughs) What are you doing? Hiding in the bedroom, (laughs) the door locked, (laughs) laid out in a comfy position with my favourite pillow. That sounds fantastic. Sorry to barge in. Oh, it's producer Kathy. Just, Laurie, I think your microphone is kind of rustling against something. That's probably because I was readjusting my pillow. I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) This is, I'm tickled that I am locked in a room with nobody to bother me and I just get to lay back and try not to let my microphone phone Russell. Uh, so <laughs> why do you think that you're lazier than other people? You know, I don't know. Like two of my sisters just they run circles around me all the time. I remember my dad being lazy. You know, he went to work every day. But when he got home, he was on the couch. I guess I take after my dad. And I'm just wondering, is it a physiological thing? Or is it a mental thing? block i don't know do you actually wish that you were more motivated or more energetic or are you at peace with what you got going on i've come to the point that i'm making peace with it but i do wish i was more energetic i have a room i've been wanting to organize for the last few weeks and yet i look at it and i'm like i just don't want to do this today i'm gonna put my feet up you're speaking my language like right in front of me right now there's a desk It's quite cluttered, and I've been telling myself for the last two months that I should do it. You know what? How about we make a pact? By by the time we check back in with you, you have to have cleaned your room, and I will clean my office desk. You have a lot less. You just Uh, go push. (laughs) um, It's all under the desk. How about we say a half of the room? Okay, I can do one half. Okay, this is an audio handshake. Let's rustle on it. (laughs) (laughs) yes the chore challenge is on we'll see how we get on at the end of the show now laurie's question really speaks to me because for most of my life i've had hurtful labels like lazy thrown at me but as it turns out i was recently diagnosed with adhd attention deficit hyperactivity disorder That's a condition that affects my organization, time management, and ability to focus and complete tasks. Understandably, I hate the word lazy. Because is laziness even a thing? And say it is, could some people actually be lazier than others, like Lori thinks she is? Well, first of all, you're using what I would term the L word. It's a really laden term. There's a lot of negative connotation around the L word, the lazy word. Fuchsia Sirwa is a professor of social and health psychology at Durham University in the UK. And she's no big fan of the word lazy either. Surprisingly, it's not that well studied in psychology. I mean, the closest we come to is it's feeling like you don't have energy to do anything. But my experience, when I've done research with people who use that term to describe themselves, there's a lot of shame and feeling bad about feeling lazy when they use that word. So I think one way to think about, you know, the L word is that it's really a socially constructed term that's used to derogate people for not being uber productive. You actually study procrastination. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the difference between procrastination and laziness? Because I've had both sort of terms flung at me interchangeably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
And those words do get used a lot, almost as synonyms. You see somebody not doing what they're supposed to be doing. We might see them as procrastinating, but more commonly, we might just say they're lazy. But people who procrastinate actually are very busy with other things. So it goes against this idea of just doing absolutely nothing. Taking it back to listener Laurie's case, she says that she procrastinates on things because she's fundamentally lazy. I think there's a couple of things going on there, though. So she's labelled herself with the L word, the The laziness word, the L word. And it's a a way to shame people. And we can use it to shame ourselves as well, too. And that's not such a great thing. So I don't know that I would use the L word in this instance. I would look for other potential reasons for what might be or may not be procrastination. Fuchsia has studied chronic procrastinators to get an insight into why people actually put things off. Could this give Laurie an alternative explanation, you know, other than laziness, for why she's been avoiding clearing up that messy room? We suggested that procrastination is about prioritizing immediate mood repair over long-term attainment of your goals. And so if you're a procrastinator, you have difficulty thinking about the future you that's going to have to deal with the consequences of the things that you put off. And the reason that you're procrastinating in the first place, the core reason that we propose it has to do with poor mood regulation. So if you've got this task and it upsets your sense of self-esteem, you're frustrated, you don't know how to manage those challenging emotions associated with the task, the easiest way to manage that mood is to take that task and put aside and delay it. And now you feel better. But those emotions are still there. And we've seen this in numerous studies. People who are prone to procrastination, they feel really bad, they feel guilty, they feel ashamed, and then they actually procrastinate more. Is procrastination something that we can see inside the brain? Like, could you see different parts of the brain lighting up if they're more like to procrastinate? You know? Yes, absolutely. There's been some really cool behavioral neuroscience research that's been going on the last few years. What they found is the areas of the brain that differed between those who chronically procrastinate and those who tended not to procrastinate were the regions of the brain that had to do with temporal thinking, thinking about the future, and managing emotions and tolerance to negative emotions. That's really fascinating because if there's a task that I don't really feel like doing, I'll just go, you know what, that's for future Alex to deal with. Yeah, I think we all do that. And and the problem is when you say future Alex, you're kind of making future Alex a stranger, right? There's a detachment, a dissociation. And this is one of the things that we found is that people who are prone to procrastination have less of a connection to that future self. So it's easy to say, oh, future Alex will do it because he's not a real person yet. He doesn't exist. That actually is very accurate. And then it gets to sort of the deadline day. And I'm like, oh, past Alex. That's right. terrible individual. So procrastination is to do with the negative emotions connected to unpleasant tasks and maybe being less in touch with the future you who's going to have to deal with them eventually. But shaming herself by using the L word is only likely to make things worse for Laurie. So far, so psychological. But what about Laurie's love for lying around? That lack of energy to be more like her lively sisters and gym-loving colleagues? That sounds more physical. So is there a biological explanation for how much energy we have? Humans are really energetic compared to other apes. Chimps and bonobos and gorillas and orangutans, our closest relatives, they're all incredibly lazy. You know, they're spending eight hours a day just sort of resting and digesting. Humans are incredibly active compared to them. So evolutionarily, we're all high energy. Herman Ponser is Professor of Evolutionary Anthropology and Global Health at Duke University in the US, and he studies human evolution. Keen Crowd Science listeners might remember that Herman recently helped us answer a question in an episode called Where Does Our Fat Go When We Exercise?, which you can find in our extensive Crowd Science archive where he talked about how the body burns calories. This time, we need to quiz him on the outcome of that, our energy levels. We are hunter-gatherers, and when we made that transition from just sort of gathering plant foods like other apes do, to adding hunting into that, it meant a much more active lifestyle because fruit doesn't run away, but game does. So hunting and gathering made us really physically active. It demanded that we be physically active. So now, two million years later, on average, humans are much more active than apes are. And even sort of lazy people are more active than a typical ape is. 
But, of course, people vary in how much they want to get out and move. And interestingly, that seems to be what we call a heritable trait. The variants of the genes you carry seem to shape how active you feel like you want to be. Environment plays a huge role as well, probably a bigger role than genetics does. It's genes and environment together that kind of shape our bodies and shape how we feel about things as well. I always hear that word metabolism thrown around, yeah. that biological process where our body's taking what we've eaten and turning it into energy. Like, is there a biological relationship between someone's metabolism and how energetic they might feel? That's a great question, and I don't think that we've answered that one yet as scientists. But here's what I can say. Our intuitions about how active we feel often don't correlate to how many calories we actually burn. So if you ask people, do you think you have a fast metabolism or a slow metabolism? They'll tell you, oh, I have a slow metabolism because I have a really hard time keeping weight off. Or, oh, I have a fast metabolism because I'm able to keep thin without working at it at all. But when you actually measure the energy expenditures of those people, it doesn't compare like you'd expect. People who are overweight don't have slow metabolisms, for example. And people who have no trouble keeping their weight off don't have fast metabolisms. And so I think our intuition about having lots of energy or being a fast metabolism or slow metabolism, I'm not sure it actually connects very well with what our bodies are actually doing under the hood. Moving on to like the environmental factors. Mm -hmm. Now, you've looked at activity levels in our industrialized societies compared to hunter-gatherer societies living today. So how do we compare? Yeah, so I've had the chance to work with people who are hunting and gathering today, and they get more physical activity in a day than we get in a week. We're just way more sedentary. Could the fact that we're living a more sedentary lifestyle sap our energy? Could our body just be like, well, you know what? I know you're not going to be doing lots of work, so just feel lazy all the time. <laughs> it's definitely true that the environments we live in just invite us to be lazy. You know, soft sofas, something good on the television, and snacks in the fridge you know, it's so easy to not be active. And if you can get past it and get yourself out there and moving, people generally feel better, right? It didn't used to be a choice. Being active all day used to be part of just being alive. And now we have to choose to be active. So we have to make our environments so that they encourage us to get out and move. Maybe Lori can somehow work on her environment to encourage herself to be more active and energetic. I don't know. Maybe a less comfy sofa or a lumpier pillow or something. But Laurie is definitely not lazing around all day. You still want to transfer her? Her job as an intensive care nurse is extremely demanding. Over 97. Where I work, it is life and death. And so I'm absolutely okay. motivated and I do what I have to do. Okay, thanks, doctor. But I don't go above and beyond to do extra things like reorganizing. <laughs> Wait, not, <laughs> One of my not, nurses reorganized the entire supply room. And it was something I had looked at for a long time, thinking this would make more sense if we did it this way. But, I, you know, I don't want to pick okay. up all those supplies and move them. <laughs> OK, so let's um, take a bit back because you're beating yourself off about not going above and beyond. Yeah. But the basic function of your job is saving people's lives. And you're brushing that off as, oh, you know, I'm just doing the basics. You know, I don't have any motivation to do the rest of it. But I love it. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> there's just no way to explain. I mean, I love it. I love it the same way that I love eating chocolate. It fulfills me on so many levels. That's so beautiful. You do not need to organize any cupboards. You are using all your energy to have this pure <laughs> love and apply that to every single person that you help. I feel as though I have to be like the intensive care bear right now. Like, be nice to yourself. But I only work four <laughs> days a week. How many hours? Uh, 12 hours a day. Okay, so 48 hours a week when you're looking around and seeing these other people do you genuinely think they have more energy than you do because it sounds like you're doing a very very mentally and physically taxing job i mean they're nurses too they're doing the same job i'm doing and they're going to the committees and they're going how anybody goes to the gym at four o'clock in the morning before they go and what? nurse all day long is beyond me right four in the morning Oh, yeah, they get up at four in the morning to go to the gym and work out before they go to work, before no. they come to work at 6.45 and work a 12-hour shift. If I go to the gym, I come home and take a four-hour nap. I feel as though you're doing a lot and uh, you should be nicer to yourself, <laughs> uh, but I'll see what the scientists say as well. 
part of the human strategy is not just to be active all the time. Of course, we rest when we can, right? It makes sense to rest and save energy when we can. Anthropologist Herman Ponzer wonders if Laurie's already active enough in her day job. Someone like your listener, you know, if she's active all day at the ICU and then comes home and chills out, that's not so different than the women that I've worked with in northern Tanzania who are out foraging for food all day. And then they come home and chill out at the fire and roast tubers. Well, we could put numbers on it, actually. Ooh. If Lori can count the steps that she's getting all day working, I bet you she'd find she's well over 10,000 steps a day. Well, people who are hunting and gathering are getting sort of 13,000, 15,000 steps a day. If she's in that ballpark, she has earned her spot on the sofa in the evening. Does Lori's job mean that she can kick back on her sofa guilt-free? Well... Being good crowd scientists, we did ask Laurie to record her steps, and here are her scientific results. It depends on the day. I recorded the other day because my patient was very sick, so we ended up having to go to the different tests they need to go for. I recorded 17,496 steps. 17,000? I think you've earned multiple spots on the sofa. But that's not an everyday thing. Because I have my watch set off to, you know, give me fireworks when I hit the 10,000 mark. And it only does that maybe a couple of times in a work week. That's pretty good. I feel as though with that, you've sort of earned your place on maybe a maybe an armchair. <laughs> okay. This might sound silly, but do you think that maybe you're just recuperating on your days off? Well, I mean, on the first day, yes. But after that, work is work and home is home. And when I'm home, I, I do still need to tend to these things. I can't just leave them, but I do. What happens if you do leave them? They build and build and build. And then that'll start to stress me out. And I'll be going, I don't know where to start. There's too much. There's no question in my mind that Laurie needs to give herself a break and enjoy her downtime. But is there a way for her to summon up the energy to get other stuff done, like the half of the room that she's promised to clear up before we get to the end of the show? How can she do those kinds of things on top of the demands of her work? Here's psychologist Fuchsia Sirwa again. If she has that type of heavily demanding job, you need to have buffer space in between to recover. That's actually being self-compassionate. It sounds like Lori is struggling with seeing herself in a compassionate light. And I mean, she loves the work, so that's sustaining her, right? And that's the whole thing. There's a flow to that type of work too. So it can be really demanding, but you can really enjoy it. But once you're out of that flow, it sounds like when she gets to her downtime, that's what it sounds like for some of the problems are happening, or at least where she's using the L word towards herself. And what the research shows consistently is that when you take that self-compassionate stance, you actually rejuvenate your motivation it reduces procrastination, reduces stress, improves well-being, improves your social relations. It does wonderful things, but the problem is that we have negative beliefs about what it means to be self-compassionate because it goes against ingrained work ethic types of values. Being compassionate to herself might help Lori get out of a procrastination cycle, but from my own experience, it's one of those things that's a lot easier said than done. So Fuchsia has some tips. For a start... Research she did with nurses in Canada suggested that talking to others about your difficulties can really help. Part of the stress of procrastination is feeding back into this laziness myth, right? Which is that I'm being lazy, I'm not being productive. And so what you're doing now is you're layering more negative emotions onto something that you already feel bad about, which means that you're going to feel worse and more likely to also procrastinate. But if you actually reach out to others and say, hey, I'm struggling with this, you break down those barriers because then you might find out that, hey, they're procrastinating with things as well or they're struggling too. And that's actually a component of self-compassion, the sense of common humanity, knowing that other people struggle with the same things that you do. So don't beat yourself up over it. It doesn't mean you feel great about it. It means, yeah, I don't feel good about it, but I want to change it. I'm not going to get wrapped up in the shame and guilt and have everything blow out of proportion that way. So part of it is you have to actually take some of the edge of those negative feelings you have about a task off. If you're still struggling because something feels like it's just too much for you to handle, a classic thing is taking larger tasks and breaking them down to smaller bite-sized chunks. So it doesn't seem so overwhelming. And then also what happens, which is really nice, is that as you do each small bite-sized chunk of that larger task, you get a sense of satisfaction. 
and it, you know, builds your self-esteem and it makes you feel, hey, I can do this. And it actually creates a motivation and momentum for helping you to sort of go on and do the rest of it. So that's a classic tip. Another one is finding something meaningful about the task. Now, this could be more challenging for things like chores, where you're like, how is this meaningful? But seeing it in a bigger context, is there something symbolic about this task that in achieving it, I'm showing my caring towards my family or my caring towards myself? Who will benefit from it? Thanks, Fuchsia, for all those great tips. Now, our listener Laurie mentioned seeing people all around her with more energy. And we wondered if we could give her some insight into an energetic person like that. On the wall are some certificates, awards and framed newspaper articles. The 30 Under 30 cover of Forbes India and another one from Entrepreneur magazine. Now, we don't want to make a flippant comparison between life-saving hospital work and the adrenaline fueled world of startup culture. But they are both places known for their long hours. And Mumbai, where we're heading next, is one of the hardest working cities on the planet. Hey guys, good morning. Welcome to Monday morning. So what does today look like? Crowd science reporter Chavi Sachdev met startup CEO Akhil Aryan. I am CEO and co-founder of Ion Energy with a mission to accelerate the Earth's transition to an all-electric future. Really, in my opinion, one of the greatest challenges to work on in our generation Uh, It's not my first startup. This is actually my fourth. I was in California, built a company there. Then I moved to London, built another company there. And then I said, look, man, let's come back to India. If you want to build a business, this is the place to be. A startup is all-encompassing. At least for the first two years, you have to allow it to just suck everything out of you. Do you make a conscious effort to avoid burnout? It's difficult to avoid burnout in a startup. In the first few years, you go all in, and that means you don't strike a balance. So does, that, does that mean your health suffers and your relationships suffer? They recalibrate. Everything in your life is actually flexible. And you don't go crazy with your health. You still take care of what you're eating. You still get a run inside. You take walking meetings. You, you, know, you, you balance it out to some extent. If the company is genuinely driven by some sort of purpose, then that purpose is enough to a great extent. So that's one element. Of course, you have to take care of your body. I can take on the world. You know, if I have a good night's sleep, I have a nice double shot espresso, I come into my office, I'm like, okay, let's go. The other one is having some form of movement of body. If you spend even 10 minutes moving your body, it has to be high intensity. So we have table tennis tables in our offices so that if you play like one match, it like really gets your body moving, you sweat a little bit, and then going for a shower, and coming out, having a cup of coffee, you're ready. Do you generally feel energetic? Like, have you been a motivated person all your life? Yes. I did my first bungee jump when I was like eight. Love going out, jumping off airplanes, going deep into the ocean. I want to live an experience rich life. Do you feel lazy ever? Yeah, many, many times. So, if I'm feeling lazy, you know, that's the day I'm going to be lazy. In fact, inside our company, we have a rule. Like, hey, look, you wake up and you're feeling lazy. You don't feel like you want to work. Say that. There is a policy. You can say, look, just woke up, not having the best day, so I'm taking it off. That's it. It's reassuring to know that even a successful CEO sometimes gives in to being lazy. It sounds like his drive is fueled by a sense of purpose, looking after his body and mind, as well as being a naturally energetic kind of person. But I was curious to hear about Chavi's impressions of Akil and the working culture he inhabits. So Chavi, uh, how are you and where are you? I am well and I am in my flat in Mumbai where it is 7.30 at night. And I shouldn't be working at this time, Alex. I should be done. Thank you. This is definitely going beyond the call of duty. I promise that we'll be quick. Anyway, so you got to have a good old chat with Akil. Do you think that he's one of those really annoying people who's just naturally more energetic than most? So when I met him, he'd just come into the country. He was traveling and so he was slightly jet lagged and he'd also been sick. But he was super present and I know his schedule was really, really busy. I did 
speak to his dad later. He happened to be in the office and he said, oh, gosh, Akhil barely sleeps. He works like 17 or 18 hour days even now. It sounds like you're saying like, you know, he's a really driven person. But is that a normal thing in Mumbai? I would say actually across the country, there are so many people I know who describe themselves as workaholics. A lot of people work six day weeks and they also spend a lot of time commuting. In the pandemic, for instance, I saw a lot of people start even more side hustles because they were not doing the commute. And generally, I think there is this idea that the longer you work, the richer the reward will be. And it's been documented. You know, a 2018 study found that Mumbai is the city with the longest work hours in the world. Personally, I feel like I'm the only person in the country trying to maintain a work-life balance. And people are constantly trying to push against any boundaries that I set. How difficult is it to resist that? And are you completely alone in doing that? I feel like I'm alone, but I'm not. For instance, at least one company in this crazy city is penalizing workers who reach out to colleagues if they're on holiday. I think that's brilliant. So work-life balance is on the radar. I feel like that's how it should be. But when I first... Sorry, that was my cat. That's okay. Your cat in the background does sound like you should have a better work-life balance. (laughs) And by work-life balance, I mean feed me. (laughs) Feed me. He doesn't think I should do anything besides feed him. Exactly. (laughs) So personally for me, I feel like my downtime is sacrosanct and I have had conversations with people who have sounded like they admire that while possibly they might be judging me and thinking, oh my goodness, this woman is such a loser. I think this city particularly has a frenetic pace and it really drives people to think that the harder they work, the more they're going to succeed. And I feel like everybody I know pretty much embodies this. Okay, well, it's evening for you and your cat in the background does sound like they want to be fed. So I should probably leave you to relax. They want me to stop working. They're being mindful of my work-life balance. Thanks, Xavi and Akhil too. Now, it's not just startups and Mumbai where this culture of long hours and hard work is pervasive. No, it happens all over the world, especially in medical professions like our listener lorries, where incredibly long shifts are routine. As we heard from Fuchsia Sirwa earlier, laziness is a socially constructed term to shame people for not working hard enough. And our next guest decided that he wanted to tackle this head on. So I am Dr. Devin Price. I'm a social psychologist. I'm a professor at Loyola University of Chicago, and I'm the author of Laziness Does Not Exist. What made you decide to rail against the idea of laziness? My main inspiration was working as a professor at a school where most of our students are working adults. They're juggling a full-time job, childcare, elder care, and taking a full-time course load. And I had noticed that even though they had so much going on in their lives, many of my students were absolutely convinced that they were lazy, that anytime they failed to meet a deadline or they just couldn't juggle the massive just overload that they had in their hands before them, they assumed that it was because there was some lack in them. And that really got me interested in just the science of productivity and just how out of step our expectations are for ourselves and for other people. Laziness, what we call laziness, those feelings of sluggishness or lack of motivation, that's our body slamming on the brakes. But we are just so detached from our body's needs and we view our bodies having needs as a threat to our productivity and our self-worth to such a high degree that, you know, I've even seen an Instagram post telling people that it's self-care to take a bathroom break at work (laughs) to enjoy peeing. Self-care hack, empty your bladder. (laughs) Yeah, it's sad that we think of just maintaining life, you know, eating, taking deep breaths, going to the bathroom as self-care. That really tells you how distorted our relationship to our bodies and our needs are right now. It is completely wild. Like, Only a couple of years ago, I was diagnosed with ADHD, which means I'd lived like 27, 28 years of my life, like constantly being told I'm lazy, you know, I'm not working hard enough, I'm not pushing myself hard enough. And then to find out like, oh, no, no, these are all hallmarks of like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Yeah, you've you've been struggling. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, Alex, you know, our lives are so parallel, because I didn't find out until after I hit a point of burnout after finishing my PhD, that I was autistic. Twinsies. 
Yes. And I think it's this compensation strategy for a lot of us. You know, if you live in a culture in a moment where achievement is how you define your worth, you tend to just pour all your energy into the one or two realms of life where you're not struggling or where you can kind of make it work. Even if you have to leave, you know, your social life, your physical health, your mental health, everything else by the wayside. The fact of the matter is all of us age, all of us lose the ability to get work done over time. And that's a really frightening fact if we define our value by our productivity. But if we define our lives by more than just work, I can still have an existence that's meaningful to me, defined by relationships and learning new things and just exploring nature, whatever else brings meaning to our lives. So as you know, we're getting in touch because we're trying to answer our listener Laurie's question, why am I lazy? And She works 12 hours shifts as an ICU nurse. It's not a lazy job, yeah? It's incredibly widespread. I'll hear from some of the most hardworking people who are doing some of the most traumatic or exhausting jobs tell me that they're convinced that they are deeply lazy deep down. And I think it comes from this phenomenon that happens when you set out to do more than you are capable of. Since you're never quite hitting that benchmark that you've set out for yourself, you only see yourself as a failure and you only see yourself as lazy. But of course, it's absurd for somebody working 12 hours in an ICU doing incredibly difficult, emotionally harrowing work to think that they're lazy for you know being a human being and being tired after doing that kind of work. It's amazing and a credit to Lori that she still finds this work really motivating and that she's passionate about it. But unfortunately, just the way that we structure work in the medical field right now is not sustainable to most human beings' lives. One of the major consequences of burnout is something called compassion fatigue. So you might go into medicine because you care about people, but after five to 10 years of really grueling work, sometimes we see medical staff reporting they don't feel empathy for their patients anymore. And you also just don't have the fire inside you that led to you pursuing that career in the first place. So then maybe the fact that our listener Lori likes to chill out on the sofa, that might actually be helping her cope better with her job and avoiding that burnout and compassion fatigue potentially. Yeah, it's kind of ironic that the laziness that she is so afraid that she has might be the very thing that's sustaining her. Maybe it's because she cares so much about this work and is so emotionally invested in it that she needs a lot of time to recharge when she's not working so that she can continue to bring that passion to the ICU. And that's a beautiful thing. You know, if she's found a sustainable place, that makes her unlike a lot of people working in that field and you know, a passionate medical provider is something that I think everybody who's at their lowest points and in an ICU dreams of getting treated by someone who really cares on that level. Everyone that we spoke to for this show expressed a lot of admiration for our listener, Lori, which I fully share. She's doing an incredible job. Having said that, she made a deal with me, so I need to find out if she's cleared up her room. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. So it's really good to uh, have a chance to chat to you again because I'm on the line with you to compare notes on on the challenges that we set ourselves. And uh, I just want to know, how are you doing? Because my desk is sort of, um, don't know if you can hear, but it's still cluttered. How about your room? Alex, I'm so ashamed. My room is absolutely cleaned out. What? But I bribed my kid (laughs) and he did it. (laughs) Oh, oh, you delegated. I got it done. Wow. So I've, I, (laughs) under my own sweat, blood and tears, yeah, did absolutely nothing to my desk. But you, (laughs) you paid someone else to do it. What I like about that is you understood what you felt your limitations were, but you still made it happen. So I'm I'm proud. I'm proud of you. You had a you had a support network there that you uh, influenced with money. Yep, absolutely. All right. So in answering your question, the headline is no one believed that you were lazy. And one of the things they said that might actually help with your energy and motivation is this idea of self compassion 
being more compassionate to yourself and your need to, you know, rest, relax and recharge. You know, I, I still feel lazy. Like I have a lot of things that I need to do, but the room is oh. clean. And every time I walk in there, I feel a sense of self-satisfaction, even though I oh. didn't physically do it. <laughs> You're not being lazy. You've got to destroy the L word. You're being self-compassionate to help you recharge after doing all of your wonderful days where you help people to, you know, live life. And I will not have anyone say bad things about my friend, Lori. <laughs> Including Lori? Including Lori. <laughs> That's all for this episode of Crowd Science from the BBC World Service. Today's question was from me, Lori Douglas, in Baton Rouge, in the USA. The show was presented by Alex Lathbridge and produced by Kathy Edwards. If you have a question you'd like the team to look into, why not try to summon up the energy like I did and email crowdscience at bbc.co.uk. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.